makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Stocks pause after last week's rally as traders look to central bank speakers and inflation data for more clues on the Fed's rate path. The yen gets a boost as Japan's top currency official warns that recent speculative moves to weaken the currency will be resisted. And Russia charges four men over the Moscow concert hall attack in which at least 137 people were killed, the worst atrocity in the city in decades. Now let's take a look at the markets. Of course, it's going to be a busy week in terms of trying to understand what the next cattle is. It's not so busy if you look at the markets today. Now, stocks are pausing a little bit after the strong rally that we saw last week. Again, traders, I guess, reassessing the outlook for corporate earnings ahead of some key data from the U.S. that may give further clues on the Federal Reserve policy path forward. If you look at today's trading session, it's a little bit unchanged. There's certainly the moves come ahead of this busy economic data, but there's not much that they can actually latch on to uh, today. Now, global stocks, I guess, probably need both earnings growth and central bank policy easing to defend current high valuation. Now, what that means is that's the clues that they'll be looking for in the next couple of days. You can see the S&P 500 futures practically unchanged. Similar picture for the Europe stocks, 600. Now, if you look at some of the individual asset classes, there's maybe a little bit more other story uh, going on. I know stocks in Asia, for example, fell. Japanese equities fall in sea following some of the currency warnings that we saw by uh, the top official. Yuan, something we need to look at, also climbing amid signs of support from Ontario authorities. And then you can see the U.S. 10-year yield at 42158. Brent, a touch-up, six-tenths of a percent higher at 85.92. Well, with me now to talk about the markets and to find the next catalyst, I'm delighted, as always, to be joined by Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock. Wei, thank you so much for joining us. The market is a little bit in a wait-and-see situation. I mean, we had a big, big, big week last week. And now I guess they're looking for, for the next policy support. Um, I think so. Last week was a uh, big week in terms of uh, central bank meetings, and it could also be a kind of a really uh, important signpost in terms of uh, important uh, events to clear. And I think uh, all the events last week, including the Fed, including the Bank of Japan, kind of worked out in favor of risk sentiment, which is why we had such a strong rally uh, last week. But this week, data is a bit lighter. The biggest data is core PCE. We're paying close attention to that, but it has been more uh, better behaved compared with CPI. So we think that this narrative of immaculate disinflation has more room to run, which is why we continue to be pro-risk at this juncture. So Wei, what's your take on the BOJ? Um, the BOJ actually managed to uh, do something incredibly meaningful in an incredibly boring way, right? They hiked rates in the, uh, for the first time which in is good, 70, which is, which is great, which is really wanted. great. So that was a risk event that we were flagging the week prior, thinking that if they were to mess up the communication, making markets fear that they think they needed to fight inflation, then maybe we need to challenge our Japan overweight. But not only they uh, didn't kind of spook the market, they set out a very well-articulated normalizing framework instead of a tightening framework, and markets clearly liked it, and we liked it. Uh, wait, is there going to be testing in the currency or is there anything that you do you still like Japanese equities? I know I think it was one of your main calls last time. We continue to like uh, Japan equities. We like it on a currency hedged basis. 150 versus the dollar is already very low. So I think room for further depreciation is uh, limited, especially given kind of currency support commentary from the officials. But in terms of the micro development in Japan, if you look at Tokyo Stock Exchange, wanting to encourage companies that are trading at price to book ratio of uh, below one to actually think more about their capital deployment. We're talking about, you know, almost Almost 40% of the uh, topics uh, index actually still falling below that threshold. So the runway is huge for those companies to really think about what they can do and grow their earnings in the process, which is why we're currently still very much in favor of Japan. Earnings currently, markets are looking at kind of 7 8% for this year. We think that 12% is very achievable. Um, and last week was an important week clearing the runway for micro to okay. support Japanese equities. Um, overall, if you look at U.S. equities, I know there's, a lot of, there's been so much focus on the Magnificent Seven, mm -hmm. not all playing out uh, on the same time. Is now maybe a way to, to pause, or do you think they still have room to run? 
Well, the Magnificent Seven has also shrunk a little bit in terms of what's driving uh, stock returns so far this year. I think four names out of the seven are outperforming in particular. Um, we continue to think that there is uh, room for the tech theme and for the AI theme to run. They are carrying the earnings uh, forecast for the whole index uh, this year. More than half of that is being attributed to these names. And they have also been delivering on their uh, earnings reporting season as well. So I rather see these names kind of carrying the market rather than, uh, for example, small cap that have not really uh, delivered on the earnings front that face uh, harder funding challenges to perform. So if we see kind of the, 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 the more frothy uh, uh, small cap type of uh, names uh, in the U.S. equity market starting to get exciting and starting to uh, outperform. That's a sign of froth. But right now, we're talking about quality companies driving return, which is supported by earnings, which is why we continue to like this market. Wait, do you have any question marks about the U.S. economy? Again, there's the soft landing is all about priced in. Is, is there a worry that actually something goes wrong? So two question marks. First is around uh, productivity. Right, right now, if you look at U.S. equity market uh, forward PE uh, 21 times, that is a higher than pre-pandemic levels, uh, despite higher rate environment. The only way to explain this higher uh, multiple is uh, that uh, markets are pricing in for economy-wide productivity to come through. Uh, that is still to come in a very convincing way. So I think that that's one thing that I'm keeping close eye to. And the other uh, aspect of the U.S. economy is inflation. So we do think that inflation hasn't troughed. There is more uh, for inflation to come down. But over time, we also think that inflation is going to follow a roller coaster pattern. And markets are currently somewhat complacent in terms of the level at which longer term inflation is going to stabilize at. So this higher neutral rate is something that U.S. economy will have to position for and portfolios will have to position for. Which is almost impossible to say. Where do you see the neutral rate? I mean, well, neutral rate is higher than before, than before, than I before think, the pandemic, I guess. Before right? the pandemic because of, uh, um, well, structurally higher inflation, greater fiscal largesse and high in that levels. All of that point to higher neutral rate. What is really interesting, you just now asked about kind of my take from last week. Uh, everybody looked at the Fed uh, keeping the three cuts for yes. this year despite revising up inflation and growth. I think that's meaningful for near-term risk sentiment. Yeah. They also revised up kind of their long-term rate uh, forecast marginally. Yes. And I think that is them opening the door to acknowledging maybe neutral rate is higher. They don't want that to take center stage, which is why when uh, Jay Powell was asked about it at the press conference if rates are going to be higher for longer and higher in the longer term. He said, we don't know that, but I think they are trying to hedge their bets and opening the door for that higher neutral, which is what we are expecting as well. So wait, what, what does that mean for treasuries? Are you still invested in treasuries? There was also a quirk with, for example, the, the price of gold that was at a record high. Mm, yes. Um, so for treasuries, we prefer front end of the curve as well as belly of the curve. We do think that the long-term uh, treasury market will have to battle with the higher term premium over time uh, that uh, will come. But for now, um, front end, belly of the curve, yeah. as rate cuts start uh, you know, locking in a bit of that uh, higher uh, yield uh, makes sense. But in the whole portfolio context, I would say, though, uh, we are risk on, so equities look better than bonds. We're leaning more into equities than bonds at this juncture. I have a, a lot of questions on China and the kind of, you know, reopening, if we see it, when we see it, actually what the right way to play it is. Well, uh, China is starting from a very, very low base. And I say that both for the economy and I also say that for uh, the equity market as well. China is the only major equity market that actually derated the last 12 months versus all the equity markets having re-rated, i.e. becoming more expensive. So the starting point is very, very low. And it doesn't take much of a concerted kind of policy response for bottom uh, fishing uh, type of speculative investors to get excited about the market. So I think maybe there is a tactical kind of uh, case to be made about it. But over the, 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 the slightly longer term, the challenge of real estate overhang, the challenge of, well, yes, we have heard some intention around policy easing, but we haven't seen the bazooka that is needed to meaningfully turn around the economy, as well as structural aging demographic kind of headwinds means that when we balance 
balance out the cheap valuation with the structural headwind. We are neutral China at this uh, moment, both for the equity side and also for bonds. And wait, this is actually a question that I've been wanting to ask you. If you look at you know the lack of big bazooka stimulus that certain market participants were expecting, is it because authorities don't think that it will make a meaningful difference? Well, I think they have rolled out the big bazooka yeah. after global financial crisis that led to a lot of excess that took years to, to mop up. And I think the real estate overhang is in part a right. manifestation of that. So they learned their lesson to not go super big. Um, it's a balancing act between the near, near term pain versus the longer term gain, which is why it's so hard to kind of strike the balance uh, at the moment. It certainly is. Wei, thank you so much. As always, Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist at Black Rock stays with us. Coming up, the luxury sector still in shock from Gucci's dramatic slowdown in China. We discuss what it means for the broader industry next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the luxury sector is taking stock after a spate of sobering news and fears of a slowdown amongst Chinese shoppers. Now, the scale of the problem was laid bare by one of fashion's biggest, bus most exposed brands, Gucci, which warned that sales plunged around 20 percent in the first quarter. Now, its parent company, Caring, saw $9 billion wiped off its market value last week, while exports of Swiss watches also tumbled in the country last month with many analysts predicting a further slowdown for luxury this year. Now let's discuss all of this with Andra Felstedt from Bloomberg Opinion. Andra, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I guess the concern, I don't know whether there's a protracted slowdown in China or whether actually consumers are much more difficult in what they buy. So if you have an amazing product, it's still okay to sell. If you don't really have that much of an, an identity, then you're going to be slammed. I think that's exactly right. It is what we've seen is a polarization in the market between the brands that everybody wants, which tends to be Louis Vuitton, Hermes, Prada, Miu Miu, still very hot, Rolex, um, all these brands and sort of everyone else. And the ones that are really struggling, Burberry, Gucci, they are the ones that are sort of trying to reposition themselves. They're trying to both go up market and attract those shoppers that shop at those, you know, the brands that everybody wants. And that's proving very difficult in this market. So you've been covering this for years. I mean, what makes the difference between a desirable brand and one that no one wants or, or fewer people want? It's all about brand desirability. It's just that buzz about the brand. You've got to have it. Plus a bit of sort of uh, investment, you know, brands that increasingly... If Chinese women particularly want brands that keep their value. We all want brands that will hold their value and won't won't go out one one won't be in one season and out the next. But but I think the real thing is it's just that it's just that feeling that you have to have it. And if you haven't got that, then it's more difficult. Andrew, is there a worry that a lot of the the high end really luxury brands have been also increasing their price? I'm thinking Chanel thirty, maybe even fifty percent. Does that start hurting demand at some yes, point? Yes, it does. And that's exactly what we are seeing. Where we've seen the biggest contraction is among the shoppers who they're comfortably off, but they're not super wealthy. And they've been hit by interest rate rises, inflation, a lack of stimulus payments in the U.S., and, and with those labels really increasing the, those prices, it's, it's made them more out of reach. And what we're finding is the mid-market is actually doing a very good good job. You've got Zara, which is going increasingly up market. Even, even Next in Britain last week talked about attracting, you know, you're buying, people are buying fewer, better, and, and pushing their, their selection upwards. Andrea, thanks so much as always. Andrea Felsch said there from Bloomberg Opinion. Now still with us, Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock. Wei, I guess if you look at some of the European stocks, luxury was going to be one of the ones that was going to, to help the most and boost, you know, maybe not a, an alternative to the Magnificent Seven, but something that was close. And then Gucci, Karen came out and it kind of put a dampener on stuff. How do you look at industries? 
Wow. Um, we talk about consumer behavior, specifically in the context of China. We're still talking about very high youth unemployment rate. We're still talking about very muted consumer sentiment. And what investors and consumers do in that situation is to trade down, is to consume yeah. down, right? So I think this is why luxury goods have been coming under pressure because of the lack of momentum as consumers come out of the pandemic. And the same can be said uh, even more broadly uh, as well as consumers kind of think about um, substituting their consumer basket, which is why when we look at core PCE, it changes the composition more dynamically versus uh, CPI, which is why it, it's probably going to register a lower kind of uh, a print uh, compared with the uh, compared with the, the, the CPI basket that is a bit more uh, rigid. Now, uh, to your question about industries, we continue to like growth as a, yeah. as, a, as a factor. We continue to like large cap, and that lends itself to technology, that lends itself to um, we think quality healthcare is a, a sector that we would like to own and uh, we also like industrials now that's a bit more cyclical than what we would otherwise like to own in the in the in the in the portfolios but valuation is uh, uh, attractive and earnings have been resilient in the face of uh, growth slowdown which is why we still like it so uh, a combination of growthy tech type of names with quality and large cap uh, tilt is how we would like to kind of cut across the unit at this juncture. Is there anything that looks cheap but attractive in Europe right now? Uh, cheap and attractive. Uh, I, I think European banks is uh, interesting. It's, it's gotten a it's less cheap compared to compared to before, but it's still very very cheap. Now you may say that uh, European banks are cheap for a reason, but in the um, context of higher rates uh, for longer and more resilient type of regulatory uh, environment around uh, European banks, how they have become more re resilient themselves in the face of uh, a regulatory. Um, changes post GFC gives us confidence that there are good selective and cheap opportunities within the European banks sector. The same cannot be said about uh, the US. We favor European banks over US because you know some of the uh, small uh, uh, medium uh, banks in the US still face challenges around the quality of their uh, balance sheet. We prefer the large banks over the small uh, banks in the US. Is this way also, are you expecting consolidation in Europe? Or is it, is it not something that, I mean, we've been talking about it, I feel, for like 10 years. Um, that's that's right. Uh, that's right. I think depending on valuation, depending on uh, easy access to, 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 to money, I think that uh, that journey can accelerate or or slow down. But in terms of general direction of travel, I mean, we have seen what happened the last 24 months or so. I, I think that that has become a, a bit of a direction of travel. Wei, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Wei Li, a global chief investment strategist at BlackRock. Now, coming up, Senegal's election cliffhanger as officials wrap up counting the race to succeed President Macky Sall is too close to call. That story up next, and this is Bloomberg. Let's get the latest on Senegal's hotly anticipated presidential election. The race to succeed President Macky Sall is currently too close to call as officials wrap up counting. Now for more on this, Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga joins us from Johannesburg. Ondiro, why has this election been significant for investors? One, because... Senegal is important for Eurobond investors at 13 percent of GDP. They're Africa's second highest um, stock of outstanding Eurobonds. Outside of that, they secured a $1.5 billion package from the IMF. But parameters include fiscal consolidation, such as removing of energy subsidies. And this depends on who comes into power and if they're interested in continuity of some of these policies. This year is also expected to be a good year for Senegal. They have economic projections of 8.8% growth, and they are also set to become oil and gas producers, 100,000 barrels per day from the Sangoma project, $4.2 billion in terms of investment. So all these things lie in the balance of whoever takes off the helm of leadership. Also, Senegal is located in West Africa, a region that has had eight military coups in the last three years. And so them being a peaceful and democratic country is very, very important important in this region. So what were the key choices for electors in this vote? 
two leading contenders, Amadou Ba, pick successor of President Macky Sall, and he is expected to ensure continuity of policies from the previous administration. But the fireworks is with Basiru Fai, who's backed by Usman Sonko, the opposition leader, and he wants to introduce a raft of new measures, replace the CFA franc currency with a new currency, and this has its own advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages being it comes with low inflation, and also the currency is very stable. On the other side, Senegal pays economically because the monetary policy framework is outsourced from the European Investment Bank, and so Senegal has to overcompensate with fiscal policy. So should they introduce their own currency, they are likely to weaken it, but they can properly absorb shocks, and also they can strengthen their private sector. Outside of this, we are likely to also see changes in the contracts of oil and gas that had been previously negotiated by the administration of President Macky Sall. The voting is almost done. Um, 73 per, 71 percent, rather, of Senegalese people came out to vote. 7.3 million people voted. Currently, it's being reported that the opposition is leading, but um, Amadou Ba says that they're waiting to go for a runoff. Ondira, thanks so much. Ondira Oganga there with the very latest from Senegal. Now, coming up, Russia mourns as four men appear in court charged with carrying out the deadly Moscow concert hall attack. We'll have the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Stocks pause after last week's rally as traders look to central bank speakers and inflation data for more clues on the Fed's rate path. The yen gets a boost as Japan's top currency official warns that recent speculative moves to weaken the currency will be resisted. And Russia charges four men over the Moscow concert hall attack in which at least 137 people were killed, the worst atrocity in the city in decades. Well, welcome to the program, everyone. This is The Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, let's quickly get on to, of course, what the markets are telling us, but then I want to talk about geopolitics because markets for the moment are a little bit tentative. Uh, they look at the rally, I think, last week, which was pretty extraordinary. It was a massive week, not only for central banks. We had BOJ, we had BOE, we had the Fed with the dot plots and also uh, that uh, median forecast of Fed funds. Today, they're focusing on CP a little bit later on this week, but there's nothing really that's a new catalyst uh, for rallies and traders to latch on to. So S&P futures, stocks, Europe 600, pretty much unchanged. The big one, I guess, is yen 151.38, Brent crude lifting higher touch 86.08, and then the U.S. tenure 42.37. Onto politics and geopolitics, and four men have appeared in court charged with carrying out a terrorist attack at a Moscow concert hall in which at least 137 people were killed. Now, two of the men pleaded guilty. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, though Russian officials continue to suggest that Ukrainian role in the massacre, a claim which Kiev denies. We are now joined by Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson and Tina Fordham, founder and geopolitics strategist at Fordham global foresight. So thank you both for joining us. Roz, this was shocking. This was a shock to people around the world, but especially to, I guess, um, you know, people in Moscow. What does that tell us about whether Vladimir Putin has control of the city or whether he doesn't? Apparently, U.S. intelligence had given him a heads up that they were targets. Well, there were those warnings the U.S. gave, and in fact, it, it looks like Russia had warded off a separate attack or an attempted attack just a week or so earlier. But the relationship between the U.S. and Russia is so broken down that, of course, those warnings were either not heeded or not acted upon. Um, but certainly there was a sense that something was brewing at this point. You know, Russia's had a, a difficult relationship for decades um, with jihadists. You can see these attacks that happened very much two decades ago, even more recently as 2017, certainly something that's been long running for Russia. But with the war in Ukraine, uh, did intelligence officials in Russia take their eye off the ball elsewhere or did they know this was coming and decide not to act upon it? That's some of the accusations that are also going around. Whatever it is, it comes just after Vladimir Putin was re-elected with a significant majority, as we know, projecting that idea that he's totally in control, that he's like the leader that they need in the minute to sort of against that attack that he says is coming constantly from the West. So where does that leave him at home with Russian people, that message of unity? Can he rally people in the minute behind him? Do you think, Tina, he can rally everyone behind him? 
Well, we can see what kinds of messages the Kremlin is putting out about responsibility, and they're totally implausible. The idea that a white Renault with the suspects would be heading toward the Ukraine border, which is the most heavily you know, monitored, mined, um, militarized border that they could have chosen to go to, um, really makes no sense. I think it's not only what Putin can do to rally his own people, but he's very, uh, you know, very consumed by um, global impressions. And as Roslyn has explained, on the back of his re-election to a fifth term um, and desire to project he's in complete control, this attack really undermines uh, Russian people's sense of safety. It's the first one in a long time, but it's by no means the first such attack. We've got to remember the Northwest uh, bombing and uh, Beslan uh, and, and many others. So Russian people have experience with this, and they, they want Putin to protect them from these attacks, of course. But so if there is, and again, you know, ISIS has claimed responsibility, you suggest the Kremlin keeps on pushing this narrative that it comes from Ukraine. Does that have a consequence in Ukraine? Well, even though ISIS have, have taken responsibility via their official news agency, and they do have one, and they've even gone as far as to release um, body cam footage from the attacks uh, by their fighters, um, Putin immediately look to shift the blame to Ukraine, and that will continue. We should expect uh, that um, the uptick in uh, military attacks on Ukraine will continue. Just that same day, in fact, before the Crocus City Hall bombing, massive attack on civilian infrastructure. Regardless of, of what narrative uh, of responsibility ISIS puts out, we need to expect that Putin will you know, double down, and he has form in that. Do, do you think it changes anything between the U.S. and, and Russia because of this intelligence sharing? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the relationship was broken down, and Russia has accused the U.S., in fact, of sharing intelligence about its plans for Ukraine before it went into Ukraine in 2022. The U.S. It, it became very unusually public about the intel they had, um, and we saw them talking very publicly, warning about what they knew, and that was a really unprecedented move by the U.S. But obviously, again, there, there's no real relationship there to speak of at the moment. There are tensions over, you know, American reporters who are detained in Russia. You know, there's occasional talk about pris further prisoner swaps, but there's no real dialogue going on and, and no sense of continuity. I mean, to Tina's point, obviously, you know, Vladimir Putin doesn't need a pretext to keep going against Ukraine, which he obviously has been doing even as we're speaking this morning. They're targeting Kiev again. But what he does need to do is he needs to potentially mobilise more troops at home. Uh, just like Ukraine's running short of manpower, Russia needs to mobilize potentially again. And that's politically very difficult. You know, as Tony was saying, he needs to show he's in control at home and he needs to rally the Russian people. Does he use this moment to sort of, again, because he's trying to blame Ukraine, you know, without any evidence, does he say this is why we need to have, you know, more men going into that war against Ukraine? Is that what he uses it for? Rosa, I mean, I know that we have a number of explainers on, on who ISIS-K is, but does it actually, again, put ISIS kind of at the forefront of this terrorism? which we kind of forgot about it for a couple of years. Yeah, in a way, ISIS uses these moments to sort of slither out of the cupboard, yeah. um, and they do that when people are distracted with other things. I mean, ISIS never actually went away. It was significantly denuded by the U.S. and other allies, uh, nowhere near the force that it was. I remember all the, the concerns we had about the caliphate uh, expanding, and that's not ever really happened. But ISIS never went away. They're still carrying out attacks. And what it really is is a reminder, again, you know, not just for Russia, but for countries like France, which are also warning about this, and even for America um, in an election year for Joe Biden now to be having to talk about ISIS yet again, a reminder of Afghanistan, you know, a reminder the U.S. has not been entirely successful there. So certainly, you know, we can, we, ISIS is recruiting. We can see that in Central, America, in Central Africa, sorry, Central Asia, rather. So where do they go from here? It, it's remarkable, and what you're very good at, Tina, is also making the parallels between geopolitics and actually markets, and the markets are looking through almost everything at the moment. Well, they weren't expecting an attack like this, and that's where I think it's really important to remind everybody uh, why ISIS would attack Russia, and it's very simple, the war in Syria. Everyone has forgotten that the war in Syria has been going on for 10 years, it is still going on, and Russia has been attacking and undermining ISIS positions in Syria. Central Asian fighters and, and you know, Tunisian and many others have been congregating there. So if anything, this attack also suggests that Putin could have more problems from ISIS when only that same day, you know, who did he designate a terrorist organization? An LGBTQ organization. So 
you know, arguably, he's not only ignoring intelligence from the United States under the, the, the duty to warn um, provision, uh, but also, you know, fighting the wrong battles, which is a problem for somebody who has made this, you know, this, the centerpiece of, of his uh, authority. Ross, we also need to talk about the Middle East now. The vice president of the U.S., Kamala Harris, was saying that, look, a major Israel attack on Rafah would be a huge mistake. And she kind of almost went as far as saying that there, you know, she didn't rule out any consequences for Israel. What, what does she mean? Well, the U.S. has been warning and warning and warning Benjamin Netanyahu against going into Rafa. Uh, but Benjamin Netanyahu says that he still feels he needs to do that because his ultimate goals are to eradicate Hamas to the point that it can never again carry out an attack on Israeli soil that we saw on October 7. He says that's not achieved. So he's very determined to go in. The question is, what levers does the U.S. have from here? Uh, do they get to the point in that relationship where they have to start talking about things like weapons deliveries to, to Israel? In what ways can they pressure him on this front? Uh, but it's interesting because, in a way, the French are going even further. We saw that the French president... Emmanuel Macron had a phone call with Netanyahu where he said, if you move people out of Rafa, if you sort of forcibly move people out of that area in order to attack it, that could be a war crime. You know, he used that language and now he's talking about fresh UN resolutions. So you can see all this diplomatic pressure coming on Israel, you know, to slow down on Rafa or to rethink it entirely. But for Israel, it's fundamental. I mean, Netanyahu is convinced he needs to go in. But, uh, Tina, I mean, again, Israel says it will invade Rafa no matter what the U.S. says. Is there anything that, that anyone can say to actually slow it down or stop it? I think that Netanyahu has made clear that he's not taking orders uh, or you know, direction from anybody else. And, the, you know, the U.S. moves to signal their discontent with Netanyahu's position uh, are, are not anything we've seen for a long time. The U.N. Security Council resolution was significant. Um, the visit by Benny Gantz and others. So this is very much in the realm of signaling. It would be a big step to deny, you know, weapons transfers, aid or something else. I don't think Joe Biden is ready to play that card yet, which says to me, Netanyahu will go in to Rafa. There'll be a, a humanitarian catastrophe. And the risk, of course, is that in the short term, Netanyahu appears defiant, but he's alienating longstanding you know, traditional Israeli allies. And what will the blowback from that be? Does it play out? So we have a number of elections around the world. I yeah. think four and a half billion people go to vote. The U.S. election, left, right and center, is probably the most important one in terms of consequences for the rest of the world. Does this play out actually in, in election year? I think that reports of, of uh, you know, Democrats on the hard left boycotting Biden are, you know, newsworthy. They're significant, but it's, it's, un, you know, it's unclear what the electoral impact is going to be. You know, Biden is a seasoned statesman. He's, he's been in senior office for, for decades. He's very committed to the U.S.-Israel relationship and will probably want to take a long view, but this, make no mistake, this is very problematic for, for Israel's allies, the continued defensive, and it's a big question mark of whether there's a military answer to, to you know, uh, undermining Hamas's capacity to inflict damage on Israel. And, uh, Raj, I mean, I know we spend, uh, you know, a number of um, paper and, and hours trying to understand if, if Donald Trump comes in, what it means for the Middle East, what it means for Ukraine and Russia. Is it, you know, too, not too soon? Is it just impossible to say, given the character of Donald Trump? Well, it's very hard to say on a given day what Donald Trump is thinking or saying. But I think the lesson from his first campaign and his first term in office is people tended to avoid taking him literally. They thought, surely that's not something that he's serious about, or surely the constraints of office will mean that he acts in a different way once he's in office. I think the lesson from his first term in office is you need to take seriously everything he says. So when he talks about potentially not supporting certain NATO countries unless they meet their commitments, you have to presume that he might actually do that, which is essentially taking the U.S. out of NATO. When he says that he would try and end the war in Ukraine in a day, <laughs> good luck for that. But what he means is he's going to possibly you know, d deny Ukraine any aid and he's going to pressure Russia to get to the table. And when it comes to the Middle East, obviously he's got a complex relationship with Netanyahu. But the overarching thing in all of that is Donald Trump doesn't want the U.S. involved in these things overseas. He doesn't want the U.S. involved in war and certainly he's got no appetite 
for it. So you can imagine under his administration, again, a U.S. that is really quite retrenching mm -hmm. in many ways. I mean, we've seen that a bit under Joe Biden as well, the desire not to get pulled in, even though they are sort of getting pulled in against the Houthis, you know, in Yemen. But either way, the U.S. is probably in a trajectory to pull inward, um, no matter who's going to be in the White House. Okay, thank you both. A terrific briefing in uncertain times. Tina Fordham, founder and geopolitical strategist at Fordham Global Foresight, and Rosalind Matheson, Bloomberg's EMEA News Director. Now, coming up, the billionaire chairman of the world's biggest battery maker talks to Bloomberg about working with Elon Musk and striking a deal with Ford despite geopolitical tensions. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the billionaire chairman of the world's biggest battery maker says the company is working on faster charging batteries for Tesla as the automaker tries to defend its market share and roll out a car for under $25,000. Now, in a wide-ranging interview, Robin Zhang, the chairman of the Chinese battery giant CATL, also told Bloomberg that the company is on track to license its technology to Ford at a plant in Michigan. Now, the project has attra attracted scrutiny and criticism from Republican lawmakers. Well, let's discuss all of this with Bloomberg's editor for Global Autos. He's the one and only Craig Trudell. Craig, it has to take an exclusive interview to, to get you on air, so I'm very happy <laughs> about that. First of all, talk to us a little about what CATL is. So it's not seen as, as that friendly to, I guess, U.S. interests. So why is Tesla so close to it? Yeah, I, th I think uh, CATL has become a sort of boogeyman uh, in Washington where, uh, you know, Ford was trying to do this licensing deal where they would own the plan outright. Uh, they would b essentially use uh, a equipment and technology from CATL, uh, but they would own everything and control yeah. everything. And even that was not enough. And, and it became so politicized that you even had, uh, you know, the governor of Virginia uh, refer to, to CATL uh, as a Trojan horse, really a sort of charged language. I think uh, what's interesting to me from this interview is this idea of, of just how close the, the chairman of CATL is with Elon Musk. Uh, and, and so while Ford has gotten a lot of heat in Washington for how close it, it is to CATL, it's not even uh, nearly as close as Tesla has been with CATL. But is that because Tesla also has gigafactories in China? So, and can they keep them separate? I think it speaks to this idea it's all, as well of, uh, of a sort of misunderstanding. There's been a sort of uh, uh, assumption that Tesla has been making its own batteries, which isn't exactly right. They've always relied on Panasonic in, in Nevada. They've, uh, they're highly reliant on CATL yeah. in China. Uh, the fact that uh, that they do uh, they are starting to make some of their own batteries, yeah. but for the most part they're highly reliant on suppliers, uh, and I, I think uh, the the reliance on CATL uh, in China in particular is something that's been really important because that plant has turned into an export uh, center for for Tesla globally. But Craig, is it possible that lawmakers in the U.S. like strike down on this? I think uh, there's there's absolutely a lot of uh, skepticism being placed on that project in in Michigan. Uh, I think there's even probably uh, you know room for this to to sort of grow in terms of the amount of attention on this company uh, heading into election season with high profile companies uh, that that uh, politicians will uh, you know relish the opportunity to uh, you know to, to get critical of this and. We're, we're already seeing this. We're already seeing, you know, the politicization of EVs and this idea that, you know, if we boost EVs in the U.S., are we just, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially, you know, helping China because they're so dominant of the supply chain? So interesting. Craig, thanks so much. Bloomberg's editor for Global Autos, Craig Trudell. Now, Intel and Advanced Micro Devices, two of the biggest fallers on the Nasdaq in pre-market trading today. It comes after the FT reported, or after a FT report, say that China is seeking to limit the use of U.S.-made microprocessors and servers in government computers. You can see AMD Intel down 2%. Coming up, United Airlines faces increased scrutiny after a series of safety incidents. We'll look at the measures being considered by aviation authorities. This is Bloomberg.
United Airlines is facing a number of measures from the U.S. regulator to curb its growth after a series of safety incidents. Well, Bloomberg understands the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration is considering a number of measures, including preventing United from adding new routes. Well, we're now joined by Bloomberg senior global aviation reporter Sid Phillips. So, Sid, what's gone wrong at United? So ever since the uh, Alaska Air incident in January, there's been a lot of scrutiny on airlines in the U.S. And United has had a series of mishaps, including uh, the, a, a plane which had the wheel fall off. You've had a plane which had engines uh, fueling uh, flames out of it. And you had a plane that fell off the uh, sort of fell off a taxiway and that's sort of that's prompted a lot of attention especially at a time when airlines are already under a lot of scrutiny from the regulators yeah, I mean people are terrified so what are the I mean I know there are a couple of measures that they're looking at what would be the consequences of them so uh, the, among the measures that the regulators are looking at including uh, restricting United from adding new routes on which they haven't yet sold tickets as well as being uh, not allowing them to fly brand new aircraft with paying passengers and they're also looking at um, they're also looking at the ability to sort of suspend the ability for them to approve n new pilots and sort of line, like line pilots. And so there is sort of very drastic measures for the airlines, especially at a time when everyone's looking to grow this summer. And that's going to be a massive spoke in the wheel for them. Okay, I always check what I'm flying. Sid, thank you so much. Sid Phillips there, Bloomberg senior global aviation reporter. Now also the U.S. investment bank, Jefferies, among companies reporting earnings this week. Let's get a sense of what we should be looking out for with Bloomberg's Charlie Wells. Charlie, happy Monday. So Jeffrey reports uh, first quarter on Wednesday. What are we expecting? Well, look, we care about Jeffries because they kind of give an indication of what the larger U.S. investment banks could tell us in April when they start reporting. And Jeffries seems like it's going to have a slightly more positive story to tell. So it had eight straight quarters of adjusted earnings declines. It looks like it's finally going to have some positive earnings here. Um, and it's looking especially like they could have a really big boost from debt underwriting, 125 percent growth in the quarter from the same period last year. Then Carnival Cruise Lines also reports on Wednesday. Are, are we looking at kind of, can we tell what the U.S. consumer is thinking through those earnings? Well, I know what I'm thinking, and it's, a, I want to be on a cruise right now. And a lot of other U.S. consumers have been thinking the same thing. I don't. Yes, you don't, you don't like a cruise, okay. <laughs> There's a divide here. But consumers have actually been spending more on board these ships. Cruise stocks generally have actually been on a tear recently. There's been some concerns that they might not be able to continue that momentum. But Goldman put out an interesting report earlier this year saying there's still room to run. They've been making a lot of investments and that could potentially give these cruise operators, including yeah. Carnival, more pricing power. Overall, it's a quieter week, right, than last week. I mean, last week was frankly bonkers in terms of earnings and, and central bank action. And IPOs. And IPOs. I think looking at, yeah. Because of Reddit. And this week's just a little bit quieter. So it's, it's unclear what the market will latch on to. I think that's right. You know, it's unclear. You know, we're going to get a little bit of a read through on kind of how the consumer is feeling, a little bit of a read through on how, you know, banks are feeling. But, and, you know, there are, there are some other companies reporting that will have to do kind of with the strength of the American consumer. We've seen a little bit of wobbliness in consumer sentiment in, in readings that came through last month. Some of these earnings that we're going to see should give us a clearer picture. Charlie, thank you so much. Charlie Wells there with the very latest on some of these earnings. In the meantime, this is what stocks are doing in the U.S. Futures practically unchanged if you look at European uh, stocks. They're also wavering after last week's very strong rally that we saw supported by technology stocks. Now, traders now assessing the outlook for corporate earnings ahead of this key data from the U.S. that may give further clues on the Fed's policy path. So in terms of what we're expecting, look, there's the Fed's preferred inflation gauge due on Friday when many markets will be closed for holiday. So I guess there's a lot more conviction that the Fed will cut rates this year following some of the dovish comments we saw uh, from Chair Jay Powell, but they still want to see some of these figures. Surveillance up ahead. This is Bloomberg.